cervical incompetence in this as the name suggests there is incompetence of the cervix that is it is incapable of holding the pregnancy normally the internal os that is the junction of the uterus and the cervix it remains closed in non pregnant state as well as throughout the pregnancy but if this internal os remains open and starts dilating during pregnancy this is called cervical incompetence and it is because of this that it causes recurrent abortions and this cervical incompetence is the most common cause of second trimester abortions characterized by painless and sudden dilatation of the internal os and this is followed by sudden rupture of the membranes followed by gush of the amniotic fluid outside and then expulsion of the fetus occurs now talking about the etiology of cervical incompetence and they can be either congenital in which we have the congenital weakness of the cervix due to some connective tissue disorders like marfan syndrome or ehler danlos syndrome now the more common causes are the acquired ones and they can be either due to forcible dilatation of cervix as seen in cases of mtp or dne done by some inexperienced surgeons or due to some cervical surgery like leap or conization surgeries or cryo surgery and among all these the surgery with minimal risk of cervical incompetence is cryo surgery apart from this they can be associated with uterine malformations seen in cases of bicornuate or septate uterus now how do we diagnose a case of cervical incompetence now for the diagnosis history is very important and in this the patient will have a history of recurrent pregnancy loss and these will be the second trimester loss in which there is painless dilatation of the cervix followed by expulsion of the fetus which is again painless and if the patient is a multi gravida then as the number of pregnancy loss are increasing the period of gestation at which the loss occurs it decreases that is if a patient has cervical incompetence then successive pregnancies will abort at lesser gestational ages and the diagnosis in non pregnant state it is not very conclusive we do not have many methods although you can use hager's dilator and if hager's dilator number 8 passes easily through the internal os without patient's resistance without patient feeling the pain then it is diagnosed as cervical incompetence apart from this histo cervicography can be done and in this what we do we insert a foley's catheter inside the uterus and a radio opaque dye is injected in normal patients since the os is closed so this dye will not come out whereas in cases of cervical incompetence since the os is open the dye comes out and so the cervicography done will give a funnel shaped appearance now this was in the non pregnant state or in the inter pregnancy interval but to diagnose this when the patient is pregnant in that case we do a transvaginal ultrasound and in this normal cervical length is ideally 3.5 cm if the cervical length is less than 2.5 cm as you can see here this is the cervical length between the internal os and the external os so if this length is less than 2.5 cm or the dilatation of the cervix is more than 2 cm or the shape of the cervix which is normally t shaped it becomes u shaped as you can see here in this image this is the normal t shape of the cervix because the internal os is closed here now if this internal os starts dilating the shape of the cervix becomes y shaped and as it dilates further this becomes v shaped and with dilatation of the cervix more than 2 cm this will become u shaped the cervix becomes u shaped and this is suggestive of cervical incompetence now coming to the management of cervical incompetence and the surgery is called cervical circlage and the most common surgery is mcdonald circlage and what do we do in this a proline that is a non absorbable suture is used and in this as you can see a per string suture is taken as high as possible below the level of bladder at the junction of the rugosed vaginal epithelium and the smooth vaginal part of the cervix this is the vaginal part of the cervix and at the junction of the vaginal epithelium and the cervix we take this purse string suture and this is then tied anteriorly 
So this closes the open cervical canal. Apart from this, we have modified Schrodinger circle arch, and in this incision is given on the anterior aspect of the cervix. The bladder is separated. It is pushed up, and a suture is taken high up, close to the internal loss. And in this, usually Marceline tape is used. And if both these procedures fail repeatedly, that is, in previous pregnancies, if either of these procedures have been used and still there was second trimester abortion, then in the next pregnancy we try for abdominal cerclage. And this was first given by Benson and Durfee. And this abdominal cerclage, it can be either done by laparotomy, that is, open method, or it can be done laparoscopically. And while this McDonald cerclage and the modified Schrodinger cerclage, they are done somewhere between 12 to 16 weeks of gestation. The abdominal cerclage, it is done between 16 to 18 weeks of gestation when the uterus comes out of the pelvis and becomes an intra-abdominal organ because then it will be easy to access the area where we have to operate. Now, coming to the indications for cerclage, that is, how do you decide that in this pregnancy you have to give cerclage or not? The first and the most important is history-based indication. And if the patient gives you a history of two or more second trimester abortions, then you need to go for cerclage in this pregnancy. Apart from this, if there is a history of preterm labor, even then it can be considered. Then the second indication is the ultrasound based indication. And if the length of the cervix, which was normally 3.5 cm, it has reduced to 2.5 cm or less than that. And along with this, patient is giving a history of one or more second trimester abortion then you should again go for cerclage. And the third is entirely a separate variety that is emergency cerclage or rescue cerclage. In this, we do the cerclage after the cervix has started dilating. And in this, the criteria that need to be followed that this dilatation of cervix should be less than 4 cm and the membranes should not be ruptured. Because if the membranes are ruptured and you do a cerclage, then that can lead to chorioamnitis. Now, coming to a few important points which we have already discussed. The timing of the cerclage is 12 to 14 weeks of gestation. In fact, it can be done till 24 weeks of gestation, but not after this. And these stitches are removed at 37 weeks of gestation or whenever the patient goes in labor. But we might need to remove the stitches before this 37 weeks. And what are the indications for that? That is early removal of these stitches are indicated in cases of the membrane being ruptured, that is, if there is pre-labor rupture of the membranes, PROM, or if preterm labor starts, that is, patient goes into labor before 37 weeks of gestation, or there is fetal distress. In all these cases, you need to remove the stitches early and allow the patient to progress into labor or do a cesarean section as per the requirement. Now, let us come to the contraindications for cerclage, and in this, if the cervical dilatation is 4 or more than 4 cm, then if there are ruptured membranes, if there is presence of any gross anomalies in the fetus, apart from this, if there is any vaginal bleeding, if pelvic infections are present or in cases of placenta previa. In all these cases, we do not do cerclage. And out of this, placenta previa is not an absolute contraindication. It is a relative contraindication for cerclage. Because in cases of placenta previa, if you try to do a cerclage, you might injure the placenta and this will lead to torrential bleeding. So, you should avoid cerclage in cases of placenta previa. Now, if correct diagnosis has been made, that is the mid trimester abortions are due to cervical incompetence only, then the success rate of these surgeries is 85 to 90 percent. That is in 85 to 90 percent of the cases, the pregnancy can be carried till term.